wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think as I, as I listened to Dr. Kaplan speak that possibly here in the US, the only headline that has garnered almost as much attention as COVID over the past several months has been this question of equity and inclusion. Um, and as the momentum over Black Lives Matters accelerates, people have increasingly turned to this question of how do we create more productive conversations across difference. Um, in my own research in the area of design thinking, I have come to believe that one of the greatest and largely unacknowledged strengths of the design thinking methodology is its ability to create the preconditions for exactly those kinds of conversations. I think of design thinking as a kind of social technology in some ways. Think of the advances we've made in digital technology, but then ask the question of, in terms of contributing to human purpose and our ability to communicate with each other to find higher order solutions by working together, how has digital technology facilitated that? Well, some would argue that in areas like social media, it has done the opposite. In fact, it has polarized us and made it more challenging to talk to each other across difference. So what I wanted to do today was um, uh, just share a thought or, or two as background about why inclusion matters from a practical sense in terms of fostering innovation. And then I mostly want to quickly share a series of stories from our research about the different organizations, mostly in the social sector, using design thinking as ways to have a different kind of conversation. So with that, let me let me go ahead and get started. Um, why inclusion? Certainly there are strong ethical reasons to talk about inclusion. We also know uh, from extensive research in the innovation space that inclusion is a good idea, particularly inclusion across difference. We have this paradox in innovation and creativity as it relates to this question of difference. We know, for instance, that the possibility for creativity is greatly enhanced as we bring diversity into the conversation. Unfortunately, we know in practice, we're often unable to access the power of that diversity because of miscommunication and the challenge of talking to each other across different kinds of boundaries. Um, I myself have become particularly interested in complexity theories uh, contribution to this. And of course, as we look at our society, as it becomes increasingly complex and uncertain, uh, research in the area of complex adaptive systems has a lot of important information for us about how to cope with this combination of complexity and uncertainty. And of course, what it tells us is that traditional control top down does not work in complex chaotic systems. That in fact, control has to be moved to local levels and that we uh, have to incorporate something that the uh, cybernetics field calls requisite variety, which is if we're going to solve a complex problem, we have to bring into that problem solving conversation, everyone representing all of the facets of that problem in order to solve it. Right. So uh, so in that way, we know that complexity theory would tell us what we need to do, particularly are two things. We need to create simple rules so that we can push decision making to local levels and then coordinate the locals across. Right. And we also need to create the condition for something called emergence. Right? Um, in complexity theory, uh, emergence represents the ability for a collective to come together and produce higher order solutions that none of them were capable of producing independently. Right? Emergence has also been a topic in areas like philosophy and art for many, many years. And I'll talk a little bit about that because I think this concept of emergence and the way in which design thinking facilitates the conditions for emergence is really the magic of the, the technology as we look about at, at inclusion. And of course, most of these methodologies operate through the process of dialogue. So let me uh, jump into what I call this virtuous cycle that we see in our research produced by design thinking. And uh, what has been interesting to us is that um, these positive effects around inclusion 
are not produced so much, at least I believe, by the tools and methods of design thinking as they are produced by the way they shape and change the individuals who use it. So my focus is here on what happens to people practicing design thinking rather than focusing on those we design for. And this generative cycle, as I think of it, of engaging, immersing, making sense, aligning, and then emergence and learning in action, I think has a, has a lot to, to tell us. So let me just jump in with some examples. So let's start with this notion of engaging a broader audience. That is engaging people who have traditionally not been invited into the conversation. The story I'd start here with uh, uh, is really a, a story of inclusion across hierarchy. Um, it looks at the White River Apache Indian Reservation uh, in the Western US um, where in a local reservation hospital, a young quality control manager named Marlisa Rivera saw many opportunities to improve the care they were able to deliver to, uh, to, to, to their local patients. Um, uh, coincidentally, the Health and Human Services Agency in Washington, of which Marlisa is a member, created a program called Ignite. Ignite reaches out and offers the opportunity to any of the 80,000 members of the Health and Human Services Administration working anywhere in the US who has an idea to contribute it. And then in kind of a crowdsourced competition, they select a group of uh, committed innovators from around the country. They bring them together. They train them in design thinking. They give them mentoring. Um, they give them some support, time off, supervisory approvals, things like that, so that they can uh, see through to fruition their ideas. Now, what happens, we know often is the ideas they start with are not the ideas they end with. Right? And for Merlisa, that was true. She had envisioned a technology solution that would allow people to check in more quickly and triage those in the emergency room since wait times at the White River Hospital would often reach six to eight hours. What she ended up having done design thinking and immersing herself in the experience of the largely elderly, um, non-English speaking to a great extent, members of the reservation who would use this system was a much simpler human to human paper and pencil system. This very simple solution, however, is estimated to save that hospital over $5 million a year because of the expense of long delays, people leaving the emergency room, coming back sicker. Um, and more than that, I think it has built what we would call in design thinking the creative confidence. Uh, this is a, a quote from Marlisa that I love. Uh, not being in Washington, it was intimidated. We're babies. Others are so much more sophisticated and educated. But if that email hadn't come, and that email was the one inviting her into the Ignite Accelerator, I would never known I had the ability to make this happen. Right? So engaging other voices and then offering them the structure and safety of the design thinking process in order for them to succeed is a huge opportunity for large organizations the world over, I think. Now let's look at the next step of design thinking and that is the step of immersion. Here, I'd like to talk a little bit about an organization called the Kingwood Institute in the UK. The Kingwood Institute is an institute devoted for the care of adults with autism. Right? A largely forgotten group, so much of our attention focuses on children with autism. But at Kingwood, they are dedicated to creating facilities in which uh, they can care for adults with autism. Uh, what has been remarkable is the way in which they have invited uh, their autistic, largely nonverbal uh, uh, colleagues into the conversation at Kingswood using uh, things like these uh, sensory preference cards where their caregivers work with them to exchange pictures and have them react to these pictures so that they can better understand them and their needs and bring them into the design thinking process. And we certainly, uh, uh, oftentimes we feel sorry for ourselves, uh, practitioners of design thinking, arguing how difficult it is to engage different kinds of, uh, of, 
of stakeholders in the design process. Here, Kingswood shows with the right commitment and the right tools, we can engage a much broader audience than we traditionally do. Uh, following on that immersion is the, this, this idea though of how we make sense of it. Uh, let me go back to Kingwood for a moment there. Uh, what they discovered at Kingwood through the use of these tools, through extensive use of the mirroring in which designers would actually follow and, and behave in similar ways to the autistic um, uh, colleagues that they were working with. Uh, they reframed the traditional view of autism, which is having a triad of impairments, that is uh, traditionally care for autistic people, focuses on their impairments, what they can't do, and instead committed to focus on the triad of strengths of people with autism, their sensory, their sensory preferences, their ability to act, their special interest. And out of that came uh, a commitment uh, to give people the opportunities to express themselves, to develop their interests, to challenge themselves, rather than a framing of how do we protect people from hurting themselves, these designers in collaboration with Kingwood focused instead on creating a situation that would give them the ability to live their lives fully. Um, well, having engaged a diverse group of people, having immersed them in the lived experiences of the people that they are designing for, having used design thinking tools to help them make sense of what they are learning uh, in this process. The next stage that I think is one of the critical ones is the way in which these three experiences of engaging immersion and sense-making collectively set a diverse group up to come into alignment and to curate, by which I mean to agree among themselves on what really matters in the design process. To illustrate this, I'd like to go to a university medical center in Melbourne, Australia, the Monash University Medical Center, um, where a group of uh, mental health clinicians in the emergency room, again, was extremely concerned about failure in their treatment of suicidal patients. What they were finding was that patients who had come to the ER uh, because often of a drug overdose or a suicide attempt um, would in fact be back in the ER if they had managed to save their lives within a short interval. And what they knew was over time, the interval between visits of these patients was getting shorter and shorter and shorter, meaning they were completely ineffective in dealing with them. Um, the challenge had been that there was a very wide difference in the expertise of the people trying to solve this problem. And despite having focused on solving it for several years, the group was never able to agree on a, definite, on, on a new path forward over their clinical differences. Well, they decided to use design thinking and the first thing they did was create a journey map for some of the patients. Uh, this is the journey map for Tom. Uh, and if you're wondering why uh, we put a slide up that has so much detail on it, you can't read it. It's because that is precisely what we take away from a look at Tom's journey. Uh, Tom, in the interval between his visits to the emergency room with drug overdose, um, saw three clinicians, but had 13 different case managers, 70 different touch points. He was handed off 18 times and knowing Tom, even in terms of their IT systems, required five different systems and 15 different paper records. Right. When the design team of clinicians looked at that, they realized together that what Tom lacked was not intervention, it was care from a single source that would get to know him and help him along. This is, for me, one of the most moving quotes in our research from one of the physicians uh, uh, involved in the redesign. We can think all kinds of things about how we believe the system is working, but then seeing the reality of how it really was working, it was shocking to see how far from our intentions reality had come. I think that shock, that um, empathy, 
that emotional engagement is what allows people to rise above their disciplinary differences. And in the case of Monash, actually come together to create a new procedure that has now begun to turn the tide and again, significantly lengthen the differences in the, the in time intervals between visits. So once we've got a group uh, of diverse stakeholders aligned on a current definition of a problem, once they curated uh, what we would see expressed as a set of clear design criteria, that is what does a great design have as its qualities, we have set the preconditions for emergence. Uh, we've set the preconditions so that people can come together with a shared definition of the problem, a shared commitment to action, a shared immersion in the experience of the people they're designing for, and a sheer, shared and explicit set of design criteria to guide the idea generation process. And in that collective decision making, then we have the possibility for the kind of gestalt that is where the promise of design thinking really lies. The gestalt of bringing a diverse group of stakeholders together, engaging them in a conversation that produces a higher order solution that none of them were capable of envisioning prior to that to that coming together. Um, and again, um, example here, just a quick one. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a shot of the beautiful Ivora Peninsula in the county of Kerry in Ireland. And of course, um, uh, many of us know the count, the Ring of Kerry is one of the great tourist destinations in Ireland. It is an area of spectacular beauty. And uh, continually we see buses like this one circling the Ring of Kerry. Unfortunately, the buses don't stop. And so it is an extremely economically disadvantaged area of Ireland um, with few jobs. And because of that, the subsequent loss of generation after generation, that is children who are born in Kerry cannot stay there if they want employment. They move to Dublin, they move somewhere else in Ireland or outside. Um, here, uh, an organization called the Institute Without Boundaries uh, out of Toronto, Canada, uh, who works with communities uh, together, created, uh, convened what they call a charrette. And a charrette is, is a kind of a live planning process that puts the whole system in the room and focuses on this possibility question. What if anything were possible? Could we do together to address uh, the challenges that face us. And again, I'll just share a thought here from the former high school principal uh, in Kerry, who had witnessed the population of the high school shrink to less than half of what it had been during his, um, during his, uh, his term as principal. He talked about the way working with the Institute Without Boundaries, using design thinking in the charrette process made us think in a different way. We've been analyzing and defining the problem for years. This was finally a conversation about solving the problem. It meant there could be a solution and focused, focused us thinking about possibilities. There were reasons for the children to come back. It showed us what we could do. So again, we've engaged, we've immersed, we've made sense, we've aligned, and now emerging out of that set of personal experiences on the part of those engaged in the conversation is a higher order solution. In learning in action, we use design tools like prototyping to make that solution feel real and to build ownership of the people for whom that solution really matters. Here, um, this is a, a very poor province of Mexico, Washa, um, where uh, largely subsistence farmers work year to year to attempt to make the, their livelihood and that of their families using uh, farming techniques that are ancient and rooted in tradition. Uh, an organization called Mass Agro, which is a partnership between the Mexican government and an international research agency, uh, has as its goal bringing modern sustainable farming techniques to areas like this. 
Now the success rate for international development efforts focused on getting farmers in subsistence situations to change their farming techniques is very low. They rarely succeed uh, uh, for reasons that are often baffling to the scientists who have clear scientific evidence about the superiority of these new techniques and seeds and things that they bring. But for a farmer, whose entire livelihood and that of their families depends upon the success of this year's crop, the risk of adopting these new methodologies is simply too high for them to do it. What Mass Agro has done is uh, partnered between the science and local community thought leaders, other farmers, who are respected within their community to convince them to plant rows of crops side by side, some using the traditional methodologies that the farmers are used to, others using the new modern sustainable methodologies so that farmers could see with their own eyes what the difference was that these new farming techniques were able to produce, right? And because of that, Mass Agro has had a substantially higher success rate than most people doing this kind of work and is able to have the best of both worlds. Globally, they're able to consolidate their knowledge and then customize and localize solutions working with these thought leaders. Um, and in the process, changing the lives of the farmers. And again, this is a quote from one of the farmers who said, for the first time, I'm producing enough, right? To have a bit extra to bring to the market and possibly um, do things like provide education for their children. So again, what we see in our research is that these personal experiences of engaging, immersing, sense-making, aligning, emerging, and learning in action accumulate to create this virtuous cycle that is inclusive and productive as it brings people together across geography, across hierarchy, across differing abilities, across different kinds of expertise, right? Um, so let me just kind of summarize and, and, uh, and, and wrap it up with just a few conclusions. Um, one is we are seeing design thinking, social technology as we think of it, foster inclusion uh, for several reasons. One, it invites a diverse group of stakeholders into the problem space, and then it holds them in that space and uses ethnographic tools to build a deeper understanding of those they're designing for, along with creating the emotional engagement and the empathy for people to care and be committed to action to do something along with creating these shared design criteria, which are the springboard for idea generation. Um, by creating the preconditions for emergence, it uses these dialogue techniques that seem very simple, like turn-taking, right? That, that in fact provide the structure and the safety that is critical for these conversations. Uh, one of the things that we observe in our research as we look across business and the social sector is often organizations fall at two extremes, we joke. Um, in many business organizations, there is a belief that only senior people should be involved in important conversations, right? So uh, uh, usually with expensive consultants. So we have the corporate retreat where we go off to solve the strategic problems facing the organization with a very small group of people who are often totally out of touch with the local reality uh, of the people in at other levels of the organization face. When we work in the social sector, we often find the opposite we find a group of leaders who are so committed to inclusion that they invite nearly everyone into the conversation, but do so in a fairly, I would say, naive fashion. Uh, we call it the kumbaya effect, as though all we need to do to work across diversity is invite a group of people of difference into the room, at which point they will join hands and begin to sing kumbaya, 
right? We know that doesn't happen. We know if we bring a diverse group into a room without structure, that we are likely to worsen the polarization and get the kind of satisfied solutions that Herb Simon talked about. That is the least worst alternatives that everyone in the room will agree with, right? So the structure of design thinking and the way it structures the dialogue creates the safety to have these conversations and to surface difference. And rather than debating it, use it to find higher order solutions. Designs, visualization, and prototyping tools that are able to make ideas concrete um, are incre incredibly important as we do this work. And this ability to do local experiments that build ownership on the part of users and implementers and allow us to customize um, and produce locally intelligent solutions um, is absolutely critical. Uh, now, there's a lot of academic research that uh, I, I, I will spare us at this point uh, uh, about why all of this works and why design thinking tools and methods are able to set these preconditions. But uh, with that, uh, I know I've, uh, I've, I've talked for, uh, for a bit more than my 20 minutes, which I apologize for, uh, Joanne, and, uh, and happy to turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Jean. Thank you very much for sharing your insights and uh, that was resonating and that uh, had a lot of points with what we are doing and we are experiencing at the School of Design Thinking, working with hundreds of students and uh, also uh, constantly with project partners and trying to make them also aware um, that is that they are taking something away which is more than just a new method or just a new thing how to approach and that is for me actually that was uh, the, the most convincing through the last years um, probably not the outcomes of the student projects but the uh, the what what is semester in a design thinking mode does to the people and does to this to the student what how does it generally changes their mindset in a way that I couldn't believe it that it just takes some time um, experiencing a different a different approach and then it that kind of spreads also to our project partners to the companies to the to the managers and all of a sudden they start to think of how can we implement that at our place and what what can we do there i was just looking at the at the chat um, and there is uh, um, my colleague claudia who is responsible for our whole um, academic program, all the student work, and she is very deeply into all kinds of methods. She was asking, um, uh, she was saying very impressive and powerful reframe of design thinking uh, with its focus on inclusion. My question, are there any parallels and or, and or differences you see compared to the theory you by Otto Sharma? That is her question. Yes. So certainly there are some definite similarities here between the work of, 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 of Otto and, uh, uh, and his notion, uh, along with Peter Senge, of presencing. Uh, and I think this emphasis on uh, presencing the future is, uh, 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 it, that's critical to his work is very uh, simpatico with what we are talking about because um, and it actually goes, I mean, we can go back, if you'll forgive me, to Heidegger on this one uh, and the philosophers um, and, uh, and, and early uh, psychologists like Carl Rogers, who basically believe through this, that we all self-actualize by bringing into being our best selves, right? So Heidegger talks about the withheld, right? The withheld is our higher and best self that we usually do not bring into the conversation in organizations because it is not invited, right? Um, and to me, what design thinking is doing is it is inviting each of us as individuals to find our higher best self, our human-centered, respectful, empathetic self. And that brings forth not only better solutions, 
but makes me different in the process, I think, as you were addressing, Uli, and as Otto talks about. So the future lies within us in his sense of presencing. And the way we do it is to make a safe space that invites us to bring ourselves and our withheld into that conversation. So for me, what design thinking does is it puts a set of hands-on, actionable, relatively easily used tools in support of what theory you is doing. Um, certainly at one uh, earlier point in my career, I was privileged uh, to watch Peter Senge in action, uh, working with some of his techniques around the ladder of inquiry, right? And for those of us who've tried to work with those techniques, they are powerful, but they are challenging. It takes highly skilled facilitation to make them work. And I've seen a lot of situations in organizations where they, they fail uh, just because of the complexity uh, and the skill level required to facilitate. For me, the beauty of design thinking is how teachable it is. The fact that anyone can do it, right? And, and even, you know, we've done most of our work recently, of course, we've been working online, for instance, through Coursera for over seven years now. Um, we've taught uh, the basic principles of design thinking to almost 300,000 people through Coursera at this point in time. And what is amazing to me is that cheap virtual instruction works to equip people with the basic tools. Now, it doesn't turn them into the kind of sophisticated designers that HPI does, right? We don't build designers that way, but we take normal human beings and we equip them with a set of skills they simply didn't have before in a very low cost way that makes it scalable. Right? And so to me, that's the power of design thinking, to take philosophies like theory U and presenting and make them accessible by giving us simple tools that we can learn to make our, our conversations more productive. Mm -hmm. I was I'm just um, checking here the others, some other comments in the in the chat. Um, uh, before I go to that, I have a I have a question which, which was coming up while you were talking about the the, the different approaches to, to just focus on the uh, on uh, bringing together some leaders doing the the and and have them come up with the with the solution and the other uh, have a large group of people and and we we are also experimenting with that through the last years and. Uh, it's it's highly interesting that uh, uh, it would be it would be interesting for me to to learn learn also from you. Uh, we we are for us it's always important to have small teams and, and as diverse as possible. So if we have a, a medical company, for example, approaching us with a medical issue, medical issue or medical challenge, and we have a medical student, uh, we rather ask him to take the the project from the from the automotive company. And not be in that team, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but still be a part of the team of teams. You know, still yes. witness what this team is doing, and then if there is something something special to add from his expertise or her expertise, that put it put it in. So, uh, what um, and uh, that worked quite well through the through the last year. So yeah. this kind of team of teams, teams. In, in portions of five, six, seven, or so that is something which was working very well. What is your experience with that? Again, I, I think you've, you've said it exactly with your concept of team of teams, uh, Uli. When we talk about inclusion, we're not talking about putting hundreds of people in a room together all around the same table, right? We're talking about creating a deep conversation that has the benefit of input from you know uh, the requisite variety, as we would say, of all of the people. Now, what that may mean is a small team comes together and does preliminary work uh, and then invites in other stakeholders. So uh, for instance, in, in business, um, I started off as a consultant in my career for the Boston Consulting Group. Um, and when uh, one of the challenges there, of course, is when you formulate ideas in a small group, 
um, what happens is the real challenge is implementation, right? And we may separate formulation of things like strategy from implementation, but the reality is they cannot be separated. If the implementers do not have a voice in the formation of the strategy and ownership, nothing will happen, right? And uh, so when I first was exposed to the gallery uh, technique in design thinking, where uh, people uh, intact small teams who've done the research, uh, the deep ethnographic research that takes a lot of time and commitment, right? Create posters of, of what they learned in their interviews with the individuals and use their design skills to make those individuals real through those posters and then invite a larger group who've not been in the small core team to tour those posters and share their thinking about the needs they're seeing and the criteria that any good design must meet. Um, that, that was one of the most powerful techniques I'd ever seen. You couldn't get any lower tech basically, but it's super powerful because it extended the conversation to a group of people the kind of, in some ways, beginner's minds who weren't part of the core team, but whose support was necessary for implementing whatever solution the core team came up. And so for me, one of the beauties of design thinking is the way it builds these touch points into the process where you can engage larger groups. I mean, we've we've engaged, you know, all 90 of our faculty at the graduate business school and looking for ways to improve student satisfaction, but we've done it through a small intact faculty team doing a lot of research and then sharing in a gallery type format what they've learned before they invite other faculty in, right? Inclusion without that preparation just brings dissension and ignorance into the conversation, right? We need to educate people about what we've learned in those teams before we invite them into the conversation Right? and then invite them. And so we need to do both of those things. And uh, for me, the design tools are uh, offer some great ways to do that. 